Okay, this is 5.3, uh, definite integrals and antiderivatives. Uh, in the last section, we defined the definite integral as a limit of a Riemann sum. Thus, we can use the properties of limits to develop properties of the definite integral. Um, first of all, the order of integration. The integral from A to B is the same as the opposite integral from B to A. Um, if you reverse the order, you change the sum. Uh, and that way I can point at stuff. The integral from A to A is zero, and it should make sense if you think about the area of a rectangle with no width. If you multiply by a number on the inside, you can pull it to the outside. Um, sum and difference, if you go from A to B of f of x plus g of x, that's the same as A to B of f of x plus A to B of g of x. Uh, this allows you to integrate functions that are added or subtracted separately. Notice there are no rules here for two functions that are multiplied or divided. That comes later actually in BC. Uh, and then additivity, uh, if you go from A to B plus B to C, that's the same as from A to C, which should make sense if you think about, I'm writing with white. Like if you found the area from A to B and then the area from B to C, let's just say you had two areas, um, if you add them together, you would get from A to C. It says given <clears throat> from 2 to 6 of f of x equals 10 and from 2 to 6 of g of x equals negative 2, find the following. Well, from 2 to 6 of f of x plus g of x, you would just do 10 plus negative 2 and you would get 8. Um, from 2 to 6 of g of x, negative 2 minus f of x, 10, would be negative 12. This is the same as 3, the integral from 2 to 6 of f of x. I can pull the 3 to the front, so it's just 3 times 10, which is 30. And then this one is trickier. This is the same as the integral from 2 to 6 of f of x plus the integral from 2 to 6 of 2. Um, this one is 10. This one I have to figure out. The integral from 2 to 6 of 2. Well, 2 is a straight line. So the distance here is 4 times 2. This is a rectangle with area 8. So 10 plus 8 is 18. And I'm going kind of fast because I have 12 minutes till my kids come in. I should have went ahead and did this sooner, but I did not. Um, it says given 0 to 5 is 10 and 5 to 7 is 3, find the following. Well, 0 to 7 can be split into 0 to 5 plus 5 to 7. So it's 10 plus 3, which is 13. Um, notice this one, is the integral, the limits of integration are switched. So if... 0 to 5 is 10, 5 to 0 would be negative 10. This one's 5 to 5, the limits are the same, so it's 0. And then I can pull the 3 out. So that's just 3 times 10, which is 30. We're moving right along until we get here. Um, so suppose I want to find the average temperature during a 24-hour period. How could I do it? It says, suppose f of t represents the temperature at time t measured an hour since midnight. One way to start is to measure the temperature at n equally space times and then average those temperatures. Using this method, find, write an expression for the average temperature. Well, you would find the temperature at time t1. Then you'd find the temperature at time t2, time t3, dot, dot, dot all the way to the very end, when if you do 24, you do 24 of them, over the value. Well, this is just average. How do you find the average of something? You add them all up, and you divide by the total. Um, it says the larger the number of measurements, the more accurately this will reflect the average temperature. Notice we can write this expression as a Riemann sum by first noting that the interval between measurements will be the theta t equals 24 over theta t. Um, pretty much ends up being from 1 to n of f of t sub whatever times delta t, that's the change in time, over 24. And that's a Riemann sum. And if that just confused you, that's all we're doing is defining something right now. Don't worry about any of this as long as you can work the problems later. 
It says the last expression gives us an, an average temperature. As n goes to infinity, meaning we are taking a lot of temperature readings, this Riemann sum becomes a definite interval. Um, so it becomes the integral from 0 to 24 of f of t dt over 24. Um, essentially what you're doing is you're doing that, and that's the definition of an interval. Integral, not interval. Um, it says, do you think that there's any point during the day that the temperature reading on the thermometer is the exact value of the average temperature? Well, yeah. What if it started out at 31 degrees? You started out at time 1 at 31, and then at time 2 it was 34, and at time 3 it was 37, and at time 4 it was 40. Would you say that at some point it would have to be 35? Yeah, somewhere between here, because it's continuous, temperature doesn't just, all of a sudden it's 31 degrees in one minute and it's 50 degrees the next split second. It doesn't jump like that. It has to follow every one. So because it's a continuous function, somewhere it has to reach that. And what that is, is the average value of a function. Um, the average value, this is, put it on a note card, this needs to be, this is a definition, it comes up a lot. The average value of a function, 1 over b minus a, times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. <clears throat> or, you could think of it as the integral over the interval. Because 1 over b minus a is the same thing as putting the b minus a on the bottom. Um, and on the top, remember an integral is just adding up all the little rectangles. So you're adding them up and then dividing by the total. That's how you find an average. Uh, the average value of a function is just the integral over the interval. Yeah. Um, graph of function y equals x squared from 0 to 3. Um, let's see, x squared. I'm just graphing it. I just happen to know these points off the top of my head. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the interval from 0 to 3. <coughs> oh, God, I'm so sorry. So set up a definite interval to find the average value of y on 0 to 3, and then your calculator, use your calculator to evaluate the definite interval. The average is just the integral from 0 to 3 over 3 minus 0. Or if I filled it in to this formula right here, it would be 1 over 3 minus 0, the integral from 0 to 3 of x squared dx. And I'm just going to stick it in my calculator. Now I'm sneezy. Um, 1 over 3 minus 0 is 3 times the integral from 0 to 3 of x squared dx is 3. Um, what this one ends up being is 9 divided by 3 is 3. And, it, and then it says, graph this as a value on the function to the grid at the right. Does the function ever actually equal this value? Yes, right there. If so, at what points in the interval does the function assume its average value? Well, when does x squared equal 3? At x equals the square root of 3. And then it says, what do you suppose is the relationship between the area between the x-axis and the curve y equals x squared? So that's this area. and this area. And it's from 0 to 3, so really I should not include any of that. This is not included. Ignore it. Well, the purple area is 9. That's what we got right here. And then the pink, if you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, is 9. Um, so they're the same. So this is actually the mean value theorem for integrals. What it says is that somewhere on this graph, f of c times b minus a, that's the length times the width, 
here, here, is equal to the area of the function from A to B. Oh, look, there it is right there. I totally got ahead of myself. Um, this was the A to B of F of X dx, and then this was F of C times the B minus A. Um, and that's it. Don't worry about this for right now, the mean value theorem for definite integrals. Um, just the main thing that we should have got out of this was the average. When you see average value, um, average value, it's 1 over B minus A integral from A to B of F of X dx. That's average value.